And I'd like to turn right to some of our federal partners who are going to provide a call to action on this issue and outline some of the key data that should help inform our efforts moving forward. First, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Levine, Assistant Secretary for Health, who's joining us through some pre-recorded remarks for today. So uh, let's uh, hopefully go right to that. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this critical discussion. Now, I certainly recognize the importance of service and serving in this role. Throughout my life, I, I have really felt the call to serve and to help people. In my career in academic medicine, I served my patients, my students, and my staff. That's what we do in pediatric medicine. We help people. We help children, their families, our communities, and our nation. I want to thank everyone on today's symposium for your important role in helping our nation's children as well as their families and communities by educating the public and working in schools to increase support for all vaccines. In my role as the Assistant Secretary for Health, I work every day to improve the health and well-being of all Americans and building a stronger foundation for immunizations is a very important priority as vaccinations are one of our most effective tools in our public health toolbox. I also want to take a moment to thank everyone for your efforts to bring awareness to the need to augment routine vaccinations in both children and adults. They have slowed during the pandemic and that has increased the risk for potential outbreaks. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention previously released a call to action for children to catch up on missed vaccinations, citing a 14% drop in vaccine ordering of CDC public sector vaccines in 2020 compared to 2019. I find this data deeply concerning, and HHS has been working with state and local health officials, professional organizations, and other partners to reverse this trend in both children and adults. We continue to monitor the data closely, and we want to get out the catch-up message, especially as our children go back to school and ahead of the flu season. As you know, every one of us is healthier, and all of our communities are stronger when immunization rates are high. The fact is, vaccines work and many serious diseases are preventable with vaccines. You will hear more today on catch-up vaccination for children and adolescents, including policy options, diversifying strategies, and other actions to address declines in coverage in children and adolescent populations. Across HHS and with the help of a number of partners, we are working to increase vaccine uptake and confidence in vaccinations. I have personally met with a number of important stakeholders and have charged the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, or NVAC, to carry the catch-up message, and I encourage all of you to do so as well. I am here today to encourage the timely vaccination of students, as well as encourage educators and community leaders to leverage their trusted positions to help school boards and officials, as well as parents, on the benefits of immunizations and dispel dangerous misinformation about life-saving vaccines. Vaccines, when given on time, help to keep our kids in school so that they are not out on so many sick days and help reduce spread of diseases further in the community. Now is the time to get all of our students caught up on their vaccinations so they are protected for the school year and into the future. We need your help communicating about the importance of immunizations and in bringing students up to date on their vaccinations. This pandemic has shown us that nothing is more important than the health of our loved ones. We can keep our children and families healthier and stronger by getting every child, teen and adult, caught up on routine vaccines that they may have missed during the pandemic. In conclusion, we all play a key role in helping our youth through this challenging time as parents, caregivers, educators, and clinicians. 
I know we can do better in this country and will work to do just that, learning from the past to build a better future. At the end of the day, I am motivated by being able to help people. And I know that everyone participating in this symposium is as well. We are all in a position to make a difference in people's lives. And we will face all of the many challenges together, working together to build a safer, healthier world for all of us. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Dr. Levine for that uh, clear call to action and next turn to welcoming Mary Wall, uh, who from the White House COVID-19 response team, who's uh, leading a lot of the administration's work in this area. Mary, thanks for taking time to join us today. Of course. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Um, and thanks for having me. It's so great to be here with so many people who are doing really terrific work on this issue. Um, and so many partners. I know I've, I've, I've worked with um, so many of the folks who have been on the call, uh, who have spoken on the call already, uh, work, of course, very closely with our partners in Dr. Levine's office at the CDC and elsewhere. Um, we're really, really animated about the idea that um, the best possible thing we can do to make sure that schools are staying open this year is getting every single person who is eligible to get vaccinated uh, to get the shot. Um, and so we've been trying uh, really earnestly uh, over the course of uh, since since we, since the vaccine became available to age 12 plus to really make sure that parents understand uh, and have their questions answered about the vaccine, uh, as well as to provide um, more and more access points in the community uh, and wherever it's easy for parents uh, and their children to access the vaccine. That, of course, means doctor's office and pediatrician's offices. And also means schools. And that's why we're here today talking about this, because we really want to make sure that um, just as parents and families see schools as such a key access point for so many critical services like food, um, like IEP services, like language services, that they also view it as a key uh, place to get medical treatment, uh, in particular, life-saving treatment like what we have here uh, with the vaccine, with the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, as well as to uh, catch up on other vaccines where they've fallen behind. So I wanna just say a couple of things about um, kind of our overall charge towards this uh, and then share some resources as well. We're currently in a place where it's about 43%, I believe, of our students age 12 to 17 nationally are fully vaccinated and around 54% have received at least one shot. Um, of course, we're really happy to see that it's a majority now who have received at least one shot, um, but certainly there's more room to grow here and students tend to are still in this space of being furthest behind, though they of course have had the, um, the least amount of time, but they are the furthest behind in, in catching up with their with their uh, with the older age groups, uh, CDC has been extremely clear on this front about how uh, how life saving um, vaccines can be for, for young people. Uh, in particular, releasing um, data recently that shows that uh, hospitalization rates are ten times higher for unvaccinated adolescents than they are for vaccinated, fully vaxxed teens. Um, and really trying to communicate this as much as we can and in, in, in as many ways as we can. Um, in particular, we saw earlier this year and a bill, um, a, a, or excuse me, I should say earlier today, we even had a conversation with uh, a number of partners uh, in school athletics where we talked about the fact that there is a, um, that it's so important for student athletes to get vaccinated in order to safely play. Um, we, of course, want to get everyone who is eligible to be vaccinated to get the vaccination. Uh, and the president um, has made really clear, um, starting over the summer, that schools can really be a critical access point. Um, he made a speech in late July in which President Biden called on all school districts nationwide uh, to host school located vaccine clinics. Uh, and as part of that, we released a, um, a toolkit uh, a guide to on-site vaccinations uh, at schools uh, or in the community as pop-ups. Um, I know it draws on a lot of the great lessons that we've seen from elsewhere, including um, from our partners at ASTO, from CDC. Uh, I know the National Association of School Nurses has put out 
uh, resources, but really was a guide uh, that we put out there to make sure that people understood this is the charge. We really want to make sure that every single school district is taking the, us up on this. And we also really want to be clear that it's it's not just setting up the clinic. Uh, and in some ways, that part is the easier part. Um, and we've listed many ways in our toolkit that you can do this, uh, including through the federal pharmacy program, which has um, enlisted all of these, uh, the 40,000 um, federal retail pharmacies who are part of this program nationwide. Um, and the president gave a special direction to them to work with schools on setting these up. Of course, you all know that our local and county health departments have been champions uh, in also providing that access and coming on site at school, as well as HRSA resources um, in the community. So federally qualified health centers, school-based uh, health clinics and things of that nature, as well as doctors that can be found on vaccines.gov. Um, but in many ways, that is the easy part, uh, setting up the logistics for a clinic. It's really about, once you've set it up, really making sure that you can drive outreach and turnout for this. Um, and that's, in many ways, the harder, the harder piece. Um, we've provided a number of tactics and strategies that we think can work. I want to just highlight a couple of them that I've heard already, but uh, identifying trusted messengers uh, to really make sure their voice is getting out there. I can't say it enough with the with the younger kids uh, or with with teenagers, especially. It's so important to be um, uh, deploying teens to speak to other teens. We've seen really great teen ambassador, teen vaccine ambassador programs across the country. Uh, and here at the White House, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted a conversation with many of them, um, myself, Dr. Fauci, and uh, the second gentleman, Mr. Doug Emhoff, hosted a conversation where we interviewed uh, six of these youth leaders and talking about all the great things they're doing to get uh, their peers to come out and get vaccinated. And a lot of it comes down to telling their stories. Um, and that's so potent for young people to see. We've also enlisted um, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, to partner with the National PTA uh, to uh, allow any PTA nationally or other parent association to reach out to the AAP and request a pediatrician, a local pediatrician, to come to their meetings and talk about the vaccine. Again, empowering people with as much information as we can. Um, we've released toolkits uh, for faith-based organizations and community-based organizations to facilitate conversations on the vaccine. Um, we've also provided um, materials for school districts, uh, teachers, labor partners, and unions to, um, to similarly engage students and families. Uh, and of course, we've also looked at this as a way to um, use creative incentives to encourage people to be involved. Uh, the American Rescue Plan provided, uh, among many other funding streams, including money for testing, and I was very happy to hear uh, the testing money be mentioned here as well, but we've provided $130 billion for school districts across the country, uh, states and school districts, to, to provide for a number of items related to safe reopening. Uh, vaccines certainly fit in that category, and we really want to make sure that people understand as well that they can use their federal stimulus dollars to, um, to provide reasonable incentives to students and families to get vaccinated. Um, and this is just such a, an enormous thing that I know people have been thinking very creatively in getting their students to be involved. So I'm hopeful that people will do that as well. Um, and as I wrap, I just wanna really quickly, if I can um, share my screen so that you all can see uh, some, of the, some of the materials. Uh, in particular, this back to school toolkit is uh, is what I was referencing before. Uh, it has it is full of a lot of different resources and materials. Um, can't tell if, if yeah, I'm just Mary. I'm not sure if your your um, if what you're projecting is up yet, though it does show you started screen sharing. Um, well, can you still hear me? Happy to provide the links too if that's uh, helpful. Sure. Yeah. Um, that would be great. Can you still hear? Oh, there it goes. Yeah, I can Sorry. still hear and see you. <laughs> Apologies, my computer acting up here. Uh, I will provide the links, um, Dr. McClellan. Thank you. Uh, it has our, I just want to really make sure people understand what we have, uh, and it draws from and links to a number of other resources that have been provided here. Uh, but it provides uh, by heading here stuff for school uh, resources and materials for school leaders, uh, for teachers. Uh, parent leader association meeting in a box toolkit um, 
ideas for um, school support staff, talking points for school support staff, like secretaries to be able to engage with parents when they call and ask about things uh, related to the vaccine. We really want to completely surround sound on this. Uh, and there's also a link to the on-site vaccine toolkit, um, which is our, um, our partner guide with the Federal Pharmacy Program that lists specific individuals that you can reach out to at any of these providers. So that could be Kroger, Costco, um, CVS, Walgreens, any of these to directly request um, that uh, these providers come on site in your school um, to, to facilitate a vaccine clinic. So I will end there uh, and I will send these uh, resources along as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll get links to all those resources out. Really appreciate your time with us today and all of your leadership. And now I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Tara Vogt. Okay. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be with y'all today and to be part of this conversation. Um, so let's just jump in and go to the next slide, please. So my presentation today will focus on the impact of the pandemic on childhood vaccination. And I'll also talk a little bit about overcoming barriers with school-located vaccination as a key strategy. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Um, so at CDC, we typically monitor childhood vaccination coverage through large national surveys of parents, guardians, um, as well as analyses of state reported vaccination status upon entry to kindergarten. But in both cases, um, there's a time lag in terms of availability of the data that's not conducive to real time monitoring in the setting of a fast moving pandemic. So for this reason, um, we have turned to looking at trends and orders of federally supplied vaccines for children or VFC vaccine, which is provided at no cost to eligible children, which are mostly Medicaid enrolled or eligible, um, and represents about half of the vaccines administered to children in the US. So these are the data that Dr. Levine um, had mentioned in her pre-recorded remarks. And so on this figure uh, from the uh, May 2020 MMWR publication, it shows this sudden decline um, in all non-flu vaccine doses and measles doses ordered compared to, um, to orders from the previous year. So this decline started just about when the national emergency was declared um, in mid-March. And it was a real red flag in the early days of the pandemic that you know, something dramatic was happening. So next slide, please. So we have continued to track these data, and um, you can see that the decline was steepest, you know, in that first month or so after the national emergency was declared, but it has started to moderate. Um, the line has flattened some, which is good, um, and it's been picking up recently, um, which is also really good, but not quite enough to make, well, not at all enough to make up for low ordering earlier in the pandemic. So we are currently down about 12% um, in terms of VFC ordering compared to 2019. Um, I also wanted to mention that, we, that we, we do look at orders for individual vaccines. And so those for adolescents have declined more dramatically than those for infants or in younger children. So it seems that you know, these older kids are not getting their well-child visits or checkups or missing their routine vaccines more often. So next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to share the, quickly the COVID-19 vaccination coverage for adolescents and, and adults um, as of the 14th. I pulled these data down from the CDC COVID data tracker. Um, so the bars on the left represent the coverage with at least one dose of COVID vaccine. And on the right, you'll see coverage um, for being fully vaccinated with um, COVID-19 vaccine. So clearly the coverage, as has been mentioned, um, among children ages 12 to 17 in the blue and green bars is less than ideal and substantially lower than coverage for adults. So, you know, this is concerning, especially given schools are obviously back in session across the country. Next slide, please. So why exactly have we seen such declines in routine pediatric vaccine orders and likely administration too? Um, well, CDC and others have conducted a good number of investigations and assessments into the possible barriers and some of the bottom line results are on this slide. Um, and they include um, provider offices being less available to pediatric patients, especially this was so earlier on in the pandemic, not, not as much currently, thankfully. Um, parents being reluctant to take kids to get preventive care um, out of fear of exposure to SARS-CoV-2. 
parents just not being uh, aware that vaccines or well child visits are due or overdue. And then um, finally, and not surprisingly, school vaccination requirements um, not being as strictly enforced last school year compared to previous years, just due to the competing priorities and severe challenges um, that COVID has thrown at schools. So some of these barriers are also likely at play for COVID vaccination, um, along with a host of other ones, you know, such as parent concern and around the safety and effectiveness of these new vaccines. Next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about um, some solutions. Next slide. So I, I'd like to talk about um, the solutions in the context of what CDC supported state, local, and territorial immunization programs told us they were doing or planning to do um, in order to enhance routine childhood vaccination catch up. So on the slide, you'll see their responses to a May survey ranked in uh, order of frequency of report um, among the 48 that responded to the survey. And so they um, will, will work on ensuring school requirements are met, um, communications and other things. Um, but importantly for today, um, a full 52% re reported that, that holding SLV clinics routine catch up was underway or being planned. And that, um, and this, this, this does not even include, you know, the plans for COVID SLV clinics, um, which surely would have made it higher. So next slide, please. Um, so I also wanted to mention some interesting unpublished results from a survey of, of a convenience sample of National Association of School Nurses members that was conducted in collaboration with NASN and the National Foundation for CDC. So among 977 school nurse respondents as of this May, June, um, 45% said that SLV for whatever vaccine was likely to occur in their school this school year. And 23% said they were not sure or was yet not yet decided. And then you know, only 31% said it was unlikely. Um, so the breakdown of vaccines that might be offered in, in these clinics is on the right. So over half would offer flu and COVID vaccines and then fewer would offer routine non-flu vaccines. Next slide, please. So the results on this slide come from that same survey of school nurses. Um, and so here you can see that a majority of school nurses are supportive of SLV at, at their school um, for, for just about any vaccine, including COVID vaccine for eligible family members um, of students. So that was also encouraging. Next slide, please. Um, next, I want just to briefly plug um, our CDC um, SLV considerations document that was posted on our website this spring. Um, so there's some practical information included in this guide, which was designed to be applicable to routine childhood vaccination as well as COVID vaccination. Though there's um, a special consideration section specifically for, for the challenges of COVID vaccination. Next slide, please. Um, so this guide also includes um, several modifiable template communications for principals, parents, healthcare providers, for different aspects of implementing SLV um, for COVID or routine vaccines. There's also a companion piece that our CDC school group put together, which talks about how schools and the education community can help support COVID vaccination. Um, there are also some fun things uh, included like some lesson plans and success stories. And we also have some good um, school themed communications products promoting COVID vaccination among adolescents that could be like hung in schools or sent home with to parents and promoted via social media. Next slide, please. So because we've been um, talking about routine and COVID vaccination, I wanted just to say a brief word about co-administration. So COVID vaccine can be co-administered with other vaccines, including flu and routine childhood vaccines without regard to timing. Um, there are no safety concerns for co-administration and there may be very good reasons to do so, namely to avoid missed opportunities, um, you know, because you have kids right there present. It's good to get them fully caught up with all the vaccines that are recommended. However, um, it, it is acknowledged that we, we don't and we don't have data to support this, but, you know, parents may be reluctant to agree to co-administration. 
Um, so this could you know, impact SLB planning. Um, at, SL at CDC, we're, we're working to learn more about parent attitudes and preferences related to administration. So next slide, please. Um, so in conclusion, many school-aged children and adolescents missed routinely recommended vaccines over the last year and a half um, due to COVID-related disruptions, um, especially concerning our measles vaccines because of the potential for outbreaks, like we saw in 2019, um, and then adolescent uh, vaccines because they are challenging even in you know, non-pandemic times. And then, of course, um, there's flu and COVID vaccines, that, which are both really critical to keeping kids in school. So, um, yeah, school-located vaccination can help kids get vaccinated so they can be protected from vaccine-preventable diseases and can stay in school. Uh, so next slide, please. And this is just an acknowledgement of, you know, my CDC colleagues that have helped. And then the next slide is just um, thank you and, and best of luck to everybody in your endeavors as you consider or actually implement SLV. So thank you.